my father in my early years would take us the family on a vacation to the Gulf of Mexico it was there was very, there were very few people in that part of the state at the time and um, I just I've grown up nearby at times in my life and then of course when Judy and I were married it's because I was living at the time and she was living close to the Gulf of Mexico we lived in Mobile and uh, when I found opportunity to be near the water we did Judy and I used to date and go across the bay and walk out on the piers there's just something about being around the water it's uh, it really boosts your spirit and it's good for your health well um, as we have through the years taken our vacations we like to go back to the Gulf go back to the sand on the beach and and enjoy the sunshine and the water and the whatever and this one place where we've gone for several years is uh, I don't know how to describe it but Panama City is here and Mobile is here and the, the landform is making a uh, there's a bow in the landform so if you get here where we were in Destin or yes Fort Walton when you're when you're on the beach in Fort Walton you have to understand you can only see 16 miles to the curvature of the earth but standing here you see all the way to Destin and all the way to Panama City why because they built these condos that are up in the air and so you you're seeing farther and you're actually standing here in Fort Walton but you're seeing Panama City 50 60 miles away it's it's an interesting thing if you're really aware of what's going on and you look this direction and if you could see if there were not if the curvature of the earth were not so pronounced between where you're standing and New Orleans you would be able to see New Orleans you can only see the mobile and the buildings in mobile but that's still 50 60 miles that way now because I've traveled so much by air I've had the privilege of flying from New Orleans across or from Pensacola across or from Birmingham down or whatever and so you get up 30 32 thousand feet in the air and you're you're going you're you're over water but because you're elevated you're able to look down and there's Fort Walton and there's Destin and there's Panama City and it, I mean it's just it's amazing you get you, you increase your elevation and you're able to see and you're able to identify because you have spent so many years of your life times in your life in these places going through them whatever you recognize what you're seeing so I'm I'm sharing this with you because I want you to understand what we're about to read in chapter 21 of Revelation and if you have a Bible you want to follow along that's great Now, who wrote the book of Revelation? John. And John finds a way of expressing what he's seeing and what he's hearing. So I'm in chapter 21 of Revelation. And John said, I saw, has to be a vision. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. I'm in Revelation 21 and verse 1. Oh, okay. okay? There was the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now this has to be in the future, of course, because the new heaven and new earth haven't arrived yet. And they certainly hadn't arrived in the days of John. So in vision, he is being transported. He is being taken forward in time. But we're going to see that God wants to be sure he really gets a, a, a good view of what 
is about to be shown to him. And you'll see in a moment, and I was lifted up to a great and high mountain. There's your 32,000 feet in the air or whatever, and you're, you're, you have this vast perspective, this view spread out before you. So let's go on. John said, I, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, when you get the dimensions of the holy city, New Jerusalem, here in a few moments, you have to understand that John is way off up here and way off back here because just one side of the holy city, just one side is reckoned by some to be as much as 1,200 miles. So if he is seeing the whole city in his view, he's got to be, his perspective has to be a distance away, a long way away. I heard a great voice, verse 3, out of heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle of God. That's the sanctuary, that's the temple, that's the house of God, is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Now before we get to the tears business here, let's understand that it appears, reading this book from cover to cover, it appears that God's original purpose was to live here with us. And we get several hints way back in Genesis. There was a garden, it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And it's referred to in Scripture as Eden, the garden of... In other words, this garden was not only planted by God, it belongs to God. Now, you and I can take a step forward and say, well, that explains why the Garden of Eden was taken away. That's... Uh, that's an Adventist perspective. You understand that the Garden of Eden was removed and it's going to be returning here in chapter 21 of Revelation. So God, uh, I don't know if it was Ellen White or just the pioneer preaching, but uh, some have said that the Garden of Eden was a wedding present that God performed and God gave to our first parents. Uh, there was no rent and there were no taxes. There was no electricity and no gas and all the things that we have to deal with down here in order to survive. Everything that God had done there was perfect the temperature, everything was perfect. Wouldn't you like to be there? So verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Shall is, is that past, present, or future tense? Come on, that's future tense. So we're waiting for something that John was waiting for 2,000 years ago. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write these words, because they are true and faithful. Now he said to me, It is done. The idea is that when I speak, when I make a pronouncement, Consider it done. Does that make sense to you? That God is always in the present. Always. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. We're going to come back to this fountain of the water of life in a few minutes. I will give him this water of life freely. Do you remember in John chapter 4, the woman at the well? Jesus said, whoever gets the water that I'm offering will never what? Never thirst again. 
Now he that overcometh, verse 7, shall inherit all things. I will be his God, he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All right, now, I want to know who's going to heaven. Do you know any of these people? Do you know any person, any human being, even if they're related to you, do you know anyone who is absolutely perfect and free of all sin? So if we stopped reading right there, it doesn't look like human beings are going to get back in the garden. It doesn't look as though human beings are ever going to walk the streets of gold. It doesn't look that way. Verse 8, the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Now there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, or seven plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come here, I want to show you, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So here we are, we're going to change John's perspective. He's going to be lifted up so he can see from New Orleans to Panama City or whatever, and way beyond that because of his perspective. Verse 9, there came unto me one of the seven angels. He talked with me and he said, come on, come here, I'm going to show you something. Verse 10, so he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I want to just take a pause right here and talk about this matter of perspective. If I'm at the beach and I'm standing there and the water is lapping on the sand and I can look out across the water and all I can see is what? Come on. Water. Water. As far as I'm concerned, all of the world except where I'm standing is underwater. But we know in modern scientific terms, I can only see at sea level, I can only see about 16 miles. And then the curvature of the earth is going to make it appear as there, there's nothing out there. But if I could get up a few thousand feet in the air, I can see over into Mexico. I can see over into, you understand, a couple of my flights into lower Florida, I've been able to look down and see Cuba just spread out perfectly there, just like it looks on the map, except it's green and it's... So God wants John to have this perspective, not just be able to see farther, but in distance, but farther into the future. So let's look at this. He carried me away in the Spirit, verse 10, a great and high mountain showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending. Now, what does the word descending mean? It's, it's, it's coming down out of heaven from God. And it has the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. It had a wall great and high. It had twelve gates, the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Somebody's going to get there. Someone. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square. Now what does four square mean? Have you ever built a, a, a building, a house, and you want to put a foundation in, you want to put a footing in, you want to whatever? Have you ever tried to square a building? You've never done that? 
Well, what you do is you go over here on this corner and you drive some stakes into the ground and you nail or screw some boards across there and you do this on all four corners and you must get beyond the corners and you pull a string from this corner to that corner and you've got to start with at least one string now you can begin to square to that one string in that one corner where you're going to start and so you run another string from this corner to another corner now how can you find out if these two strings make a perfect corner, a 90 degree angle? How, how, how do you do that? You just got a piece of string and a piece of string. Come on Ivan, how do you do it? You measure a point on the first string and you measure a point on the second string and you have to move the string until they come into agreement. Okay? The city lies four square. So, um, in the next verse or so, we're going to find out that it says the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, that is a perfect definition, perfect description of a cube. How would you like to spend eternity in a box? Okay. That's also a description of a term. Oh, uh, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, it is a more perfect and more exact description of a pyramid than, than, than a cube because it has steps or foundations and it has the length and the breadth and the height. They're equal, and that is a wonderful description of a pyramid. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that I believe that the holy city, New Jerusalem, is going to be an incredible pyramid when it arrives. And here's why I believe that. Because we go all the way around the world and we find the inventions and doings of nations and tribes and people and they don't have a connection. This, this people over here in Central America have no connection with the people in India and Southeast Asia and around the world. And yet everyone is building, quotes, their city of God, and it's a pyramid, over and over and over again around the world. Dozens of these civilizations that have come and gone, and what do they have at the top of their pyramid city, their holy city? What do they have? They have their God or the place where they make their offerings to the gods. So we have a, a, an apt description, I believe, of what the city of God is going to be and what it is. I believe that city already exists. It's going to move. It's going to be transported. And we're going to move and be transported after we are resurrected or whatever. And God is going to bring the city that was his original purpose and plan and gift and his people together. And we are going to be there. Now I want to take a moment and give you some apt description that's given right here. The wall is made up of precious stones and they're listed. And these precious stones are of varying colors. And when you look at it, you have the sense of looking at a gigantic, polished what? Rainbow. A rainbow. So when God put the promise of the rainbow in the clouds or in the heavens back there after the flood, what is he saying? Come on. I promise you, the sea will be gone one day. No more sea. I promise you, no more floods. Have you ever looked closely at a pearl? The gates of this city are said to be of solid pearl. Have you ever looked at a pearl carefully, closely? Have you ever looked at one under a magnifying glass? It's rainbow colored. It's iridescent. 
it's overall light and bright, but if you get close enough and look carefully enough, you will see that the pearl is a rainbow and the walls are a rainbow. Well, if you keep reading, you'll find out that the streets are paved with gold, but it's transparent gold. Now, modern science can show you what that looks like. All right? You can actually see into it. You, you get a three-dimensional view of looking at the molecules and atoms and the way things are put together, designed. So if I look at God's city... I see a gigantic rainbow. The foundation, the walls, all of it. Now if you keep reading here, it says uh, there's a sun and a moon, but the city, this city does not have need of the sun by day nor the moon by night. Why not? Because the sun and the moon are shining this way, but this city is shining this way. Brighter, it says, than the noonday sun. So I don't know how high I'm going to fly from Alabama or wherever I'm going to be living when that time comes. I don't know how high I'm going to fly on my way to the holy city, New Jerusalem, on a Sabbath. I don't know how high I'm going to be, but uh, there is going to be a beacon. You know, air, air, airliners used to, before all these modern times have come, they used to have beacons. It was, there was one at the Birmingham airport during the Second World War. I can remember it very, very clearly. It was a very bright, intense light, and it shines right straight up in the sky. And the pilots back then who were trying to, you know, get from one place to the next, especially at night, they're looking for those beacons. Well, here's a beacon of light, this holy city. And God's people are going to come, it says, from every new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Now, I've already picked out my condo. I don't mind telling you. I've already, you know. My name's going to be on a plate on the door. I'm going to have plenty of room and space in my condo to stir and move around, stretch out. None of this. Go through the right gate, don't you? Don't we all go? What I'm saying is this. There is a picture painted in Scripture of what God's original purpose for you and me and us was. Right now, all of that is set in pause. Waiting, 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 waiting. It's painful. Waiting is painful. And especially if the devil is beating on your body and you are, even the doctors are mystified to know what to do. Now, if you could get through the gate of pearl and you could get into the city and you looked at the flowers, what would you see? Rainbow. If you could see all the different birds, what would you see? A rainbow. If you could look at all the butterflies, what would you see? A rainbow. Now, it has taken modern man and modern instruments to look up into the sky. When we put our Hubble telescope up there in orbit, we had a view of the heavens that we had never enjoyed before down here because you're looking through dust and haze and clouds and waves of, you know. But with that Hubble telescope, everything is crystal clean and clear. And when we began to put our modern telescopes on the star nearby stars and part of our nearby galaxy that we call the Milky Way, <coughs> Tell me what it looks like. Like a rainbow. So what did God say to Noah when the floodwaters 
had subsided. I have set my bow of promise in the heavens. You ever thought about this? I have set my bow of promise in the heavens. And the promise is that there will never, ever be another flood, which was said to be worldwide. I'm not going to, I'm not going to destroy all flesh. I'm not going to do this. And how can we know that is true? Because if you keep reading, when Jesus arrives, He's going to take the living saints and He's going to resurrect the sleeping saints. And when the thousand years are done and our, our planet is parked in a new place in the heavens, and that's what's going to happen. New heavens and a new earth. Jesus said while He was here, He said, don't you understand that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not? So there are some strange and wonderful things ahead for us. I want to share just a few more, a few more verses here. We read about the gates. And I want to come to verse 15, please. Chapter 21. And he that talked with me had a measuring stick to measure the city and the gates and the wall. Now the city lies four square. The length is as large as the breadth. In other words, if, if these sides were equal here, that's the length and the breadth of it are equal. But we're going to see that we go not only the length and the breadth, but we're going to go this way. We call this the what dimension? One, two, the third dimension. When I was uh, in elementary school, I liked to draw pictures. Kids like to draw pictures. And I love to draw airplanes, and I love to draw horses, and you know. Now my airplanes didn't look much like flying. And my horses didn't look much like running because I'm a typical whirling. I see two dimensions and it's very difficult for me to draw the third dimension. I don't know if that's been a problem with you or not, but that's been a problem all my life. I can't get the proportions right. I can't. But this is giving us the proportions. He measured, verse 17, the wall, this angel. It's 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is, of the angel. The building of the wall was of jasper, the city pure gold and likened to clear glass. Now, I don't know because I don't, I don't measure in cubits and all of this kind of thing. I don't know if the 1,200 miles is 300 miles on each side times four. That's the 1,200 miles. It doesn't matter. It has been determined by people who have determined that the, the space, the area within this city is such that every human being alive and every human being who has ever lived can be in this city and nobody's bumping into the other one. There's that much space. Now I'll just tell you plainly, I'm, I'm planning on a vacation home. I don't think I'm going to live in the New Jerusalem. I think I'm going to have a condo there and you are and all of us are going to be not strangers there. Maybe the first few times we'll just have to learn our way around in this great city of God. But I, I, I'm, I like the way Ellen White expressed it. She said, I was uh, in, in my vision or my dream, I saw brother so-and-so and we were walking together in the city and we felt as though we had a perfect right to be there. We may be strangers coming in, but after I learn my way around, I'm sure there are sites and places to go that I'll want to go more frequently. She also, in the book Education, says that 
sin has so diminished and weakened our senses that what the scripture says is exactly true. We see through a glass darkly. We, we, we don't see as things are. But in the book Education, she talks about Adam and Eve before sin entered the garden with them. And they had the ability of looking at a leaf on a plant or a tree and looking three-dimensional into the leaf and explore the inner workings of the leaf. You listening? I would love that. I mean, that, that would just... I, I could spend a couple of thousand years on grass and a couple of thousand more on trees. And We're going to have abilities. We're going to have talents. We're going to have things then that we don't have now. We're waiting. Adam and Eve must have been something else. You know, they must have been not only superior in height and physical prowess, but they had abilities in the senses that you and I can't even approach. In order to look down inside a leaf today, we have to invent not simply microscopes, but electron microscopes. And to be able to look down layer by layer by layer by cellular layer into a leaf, for example, into whatever. This is going to be quite a trip, folk. Now the foundations, verse 19 of the wall, were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper and sapphire. I have, a, I have a book of minerals that I purchased. And I decided one day, because it has color photos, I decided one day that I was going to list all of the stones in here, and I was going to find the pictures in color in my mineral book and try and picture for myself what, what, what I'm looking at. Now, it's, it's not going, you know, a rainbow, one color goes into the, it's not a hard, fast, like, oh, it's every, this color blends itself into the next color and into the next color and into the next. There's a harmony in all of this. And if we could be scientific for a moment, I will tell you that each one of these stones in crystalline form, and that's what these are, these are the crystalline form of these precious stones and elements and minerals, if, if we could be scientific about what we're looking at, each color has a vibration. It has an identity, each color. And so we have what we call spectrographs or spectrographic instruments in which we can look at, at light of anything and anywhere, any kind. We can look at the light and we can tell you what the elements, the minerals are in that crystal. And we can tell you by proportion what this crystal jasper is made of. Now the gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold and as it were transparent glass. The street was pure gold, like transparent glass. I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut, not in daytime, and there will be no night. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter in anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
And one more, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side, there was the tree of life. You're getting the, you're getting the picture. This, this tree has evidently two trunks that grow up and come together above the river, the river of life. And this is called the tree of life. So this is what I want to share with you. It says that this tree of life bears 12 manner of fruit. How many? What's wrong with 10? Well, not everything, but this it's, it's described as this tree bears 12 manner of fruit. And the idea is each in his season or each at his time. So on this planet that we live on, and as we go around the sun and make our coursing through the year, how many months are there? Hmm. So whatever this tree of life is going to be, or whatever it is, and by the way, right now we are forbidden. See, there was a tree that was forbidden. There was a fruit that was forbidden. As long as you obeyed the forbidden of those, you had access to the tree of life. Once you partook of the evil tree and the evil fruit, you no longer can have access to the tree of life. Why not? Come on, let's make sense of it. Why not? Why would God say, sorry? Because you would be a sinner forever if God did that. And He has no plan for that. He loves you and me too much to allow that to happen. So we have the promise of a time to come in the which we will have access to the river of life and the tree of life and the city of life. And that's what it is because that's why it says they never close the gates. It's in business 24 hours a day. And the 24 hours are not based on the sun and the moon. It's because God is tireless. And he, his, it's His light and His glory that shines throughout all of this. Now, this is my idea. I'm rarely ever mistaken. All right, you listening? If I live in Alabama and we're approaching the new moon or Sabbath and I'm on my way to the city, I have this word that this month I'm going to have immaculate, pristine, gigantic apples. Next month, I mean, we don't want to bore people for eternity. Next month, what am I going to have? Mangoes. There you go. <laughs> and the next month, what? Am, in other words, God has put a rainbow of fruit on this tree. Everything about this whole picture is rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. Beauty, beauty, beauty. Full color. So when we turn our modern telescopes out there and we look at, say, Orion or some other nebula, we don't just see white light anymore. That's what the early telescopes could give us. Not anymore. We see in full spectral color. And guess what it looks like? A rainbow. Absolutely. So God's promise to you and me is I know it's bad. I know it's tough. I know it's painful. But I promise you, rainbows forever. Does that make sense? I'll take it. I'll tell you right now. And I don't want a second mortgage on my condo. I, I, I don't want anything about how 
we call life or live down here in this. It's just mere existence is all it is. I don't want any of this there. I want it to be completely different. I want it to be a whole new experience. And according to what we're reading, that's what it's going to be. Heaven is going to be a new experience. And we're never going to be bored. And we're never going to get tired. There's a sign on the door. It says, Heaven. Welcome to Heaven. Say. Just before we close, I want to tell you that for most of my early Christian experience, and that's as a Baptist Christian, as an Adventist Christian, as a non-Adventist Christian, as what? For most of my experience, I felt as though I might get to heaven. And then I began measuring myself with the measuring stick that says uh, no sinner gets in. And uh, I, I get kind of anxious. And then I discover at the end of this book that this sanctuary service that's going to be completed in heaven, there's been a model of it, a scale model of it down here, and the story of it in the book down here. But there is a sanctuary temple in heaven where the real business of dealing with sin and sinners is going to take place, is taking place. And I keep reading and I find out that it's absolutely true no sinner is going in. And the reason no sinner is going in is because God has done something before He shuts the doors up there. God has done something. He has made a pronouncement. He has made a work. He has accomplished something in the which He has earned the right by the vote of heaven and earth. He has earned the lawful right to blot out my sins. Not just forgive me, but to blot out my sins. You listening? Now, if you're in the policing business, you can't do that. You can't erase. No, you don't erase evidence. You don't do that. But this record is God is going to erase the evidence. Now the question is, when I look at my record beforehand, does it have the appearance of rainbow? And the answer is, oh no, it looks like a storm cloud and a hurricane and a tornado and an earthquake all put together in one. It's been absolute nightmare living down here. We were having this discussion of Job in Sabbath school. When the day comes and the pronouncement is made and the voice is heard, wake up, get up, and come up, I just wonder if there's anything in my vision or anything in your vision looking my direction or my, my looking your direction, I just wonder if there's a rainbow somewhere in it. So this is my conclusion. For everything that is, there is an equal and opposite. If there's no more thievery and no more lying, and no more crying, and no more, no more, no more. There's an equal and opposite. That's where we're living right now. These colors are not the colors of a rainbow. At all. There is something about these colors, and the new you, and the new me, that we are going to match the city. We're going to match the streets. We're going to match the fruit. We're going to match the view in any direction and every direction. And Ellen White closes the great controversy by saying, God is going to be comforted when He sees 
his image reflected in his people. If you had your choice of colors, which color of the rainbow would you like to be? You will be all of the above. You will be. You will be. We will be. I think we are much nearer the kingdom than any of us can surmise. I just, I just cannot help but believe we have come to the time. Now, if this is true, then going forward, we're going to be seeing demons come out of hiding. But if the demons come out of hiding, who else is going to come out of hiding? The good guys. The good guys. Now, you and I are not equipped to look at either one without fear. The bad guys are going to scare us and frighten us and cause us to fear for our very existence. And when we look at the good guys who are going to come out of hiding as well, they're going to scare us and cause us to fear for our existence. There's one thing, one thing that will solve the problem. Your name is written in the book of life. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord in that day shall be what? You mean that's all I have to do? According to the book, that is what we have to do. Yes. Father in heaven, we're calling upon you again in the name of Jesus to bring about your perfect work, your good work, your finished work. We long for heaven. Even the idea of heaven, even the promise and promise and promise a fruit that never wastes, colors that never fade, water that never dries up. We thank you that you have given us life and the opportunity and the privilege of having our names in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And I pray for every person here and every person who will hear, I pray that we shall see Jesus coming in glory and we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we will begin to shine like the rainbow colors of heaven. Thank you for these blessings and more in Jesus' name. Amen.